<laughs> uh, okay, well, let's go on with this discussion. Human relationships, the world's definition of love. One of the big things I find in the world today, this viewpoint that love is compromise. You see it happening all the time. You see it happening in relationships where people compromise the truth in their relationship or they feel they have to compromise in particular the, their desires and passions. Right? Now, my suggestion is, if your desires and passions are always harmonious with love, then why would love ever be a compromise? So if your desires and passions were harmonious with your desire and passion to love, then it would make sense that love is no longer ever a compromise. It's always something that you just don't need to compromise at all. And the reality is, from God's perspective, love is never compromise. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that when you are in a state of love yourself, you never feel like you're having to compromise yourself or your life for somebody else. Your motivation for doing everything is based around love. And because it's based around love, it never feels like a hardship. It never feels like a struggle. It always feels good because it's ne always based upon love rather than having to compromise your feelings. Now, I suggest to you that if you are compromising in relationships quite frequently, then you are not loving yourself. And if you are not loving yourself, then you also are incapable of loving the person you're with. Because what you're doing is you're not actually being truthful with the person you're with. You're not acting in a truthful manner. And we see this happening quite a lot in relationships where people wonder why their relationships aren't as close as they could be. And oftentimes it's because this person feels they have to compromise this desire, which they usually get upset about at some point. And this person feels they have to compromise this desire that they have, which they usually get upset about at some point. And then these underlying upset states simmer like... You know, just, just under boiling. <laughs> and then a little event comes along that tips it from just under boiling into boiling over. And now we have an argument or a fight. And quite often the arguments or fights that occur in relationships have nothing to do with what you're arguing and fighting about. They are actually just the straw that broke the camel's back, as the saying goes because we've been compromising and compromising and compromising and eventually some of the compromises get too great to withstand anymore. When we are in a state of love, we don't feel like anything we do is a compromise. We do it because we love and it feels like we want to, not because it feels like we have to. Now, if we feel like we have to, so let's put on this side, having to. That is a very different state, is it not, to feeling like you want to. So a good way to measure whether you're actually doing something in harmony with love or not is to determine whether you have a feeling inside of you of having to do it compared to having a feeling inside of you that you want to do it. Right? It's a very simple test, really, isn't it? Every time you feel like you have to, then you're already in a state of compromising something within yourself, and therefore you're not in a state of love anymore, but you are now presenting yourself not as you really are, but as you're hoping to be. Now, in any relationship, we want to present ourselves as we really are, even if as we really are is angry, upset, <laughs> moody, and all of those kind of things. We need to at least be honest about where we really are. 
rather than falsifying that condition into a place that we're not really being. We need to be... Tr this is about being truthful. So often when we compromise, and when I say compromise, we're often emotionally compromising and not stating the truth about how we really feel in a relationship. And when we're in that state... It's a, so don't, don't think that this is just an intellectual compromise on a very basic thing. I'm talking about the emotional compromises that we make on a day-to-day -day basis in order to maintain a relationship. When we're in this state, we're in a state where we're denying the ability for the, for the relationship to grow closer. Because relationships can only grow closer when they become more truthful. Remember, it's the truth that sets us free, not lies or fear. You see, if we can't say the truth in a relationship about how we feel, then where can we say the truth? Right? That's, that's the issue we face. So this is a very untruthful state. Now, I don't mean untruthful in terms of verbally untruthful, because a lot of times we're not even saying anything when we're in this state. Um, now, where was I? I can't remember now. Yeah, so, so when we're in an untruthful state, what I mean is that we are willing to have our internal dialogue be completely different to our external dialogue or actions. Do you understand what I mean by that? So inside of myself, I might have a thought of, gee, that annoys me. But my external dialogue is, yeah, no worries, I'll do that. Now that's what I mean between the disharmony between what's going on inside of myself, in other words, my internal dialogue, and what's going on outside of myself, in other words, what I portray to others. Now, often we are quite untruthful in that manner. We are putting forward to the world a totally different person than what inside of ourselves we feel. And in a relationship, when we do that, we automatically create a barrier between the other person and ourselves. And that barrier, it's like a wall between the two of us now that can't be penetrated until one or both of us become more truthful with each other. Now, in this state, so remember that was the internal dialogue. So internal. The internal dialogue is not the same as what we portray. A lot of uh, men do this with mothers-in-laws, eh? You know, the wife says, oh, your mom, my mum's coming around tonight. Oh, yeah, no worries. <laughs> Inside is, oh, God, I hope there's a, you know, I hope there's a footy show on or something tonight. <laughs> you know. So, so the internal dialogue, very different to the external dialogue, that creates a barrier. Does that make sense? This barrier is what's created. When we no longer compromise... Our internal dialogue and our external dialogue are identical. Now, for many of us, that is a major challenge to bring those two into being identical. So on this side of the scale, we want to learn that every time our internal dialogue is not the same as what we're portraying externally, we must have a fear associated with that, a reason why we cannot present ourselves truthfully. And that's where, that is one of the major compromises we make in relationships, this compromise. If you think about it, it's one of our major compromises generally that we make in our life, at work, during our day-to-day -day life, but in particular with our relationships. Now, if we could understand, and, it's, and I feel it's quite important to understand the, the, the effect of untruth on a relationship is cataclysmic, actually. You cannot 
ever be close to another person while your internal dialogue is not the same as what's happening externally. And what you're actually doing at soul level is creating a barrier through which the other person will not be able to ever really feel your true nature. You're actually not only doing yourself a disservice, but you're doing a disservice to the relationship. You're creating a situation where it's impossible for the relationship to actually grow in truth and in love. Now, the relationship might be relatively stable because both of us are withholding all of the things we actually feel towards the other. So the, externally, the relationship may even look like a good relationship, but it's not going to ever be a close relationship. It's going to be a relationship that works because it's just. I know I withhold from Mary all the things I don't want her to know and what she doesn't want to know, and she withholds from me all the things that she doesn't want me to know and what I don't want to know, and as a result, we get along. But is it the real people that are getting along? No. It's not the real Mary that I'm getting, because I don't want the real Mary, but also she doesn't want to give the real Mary, and it's not the real AJ she's getting, because I'm not giving the real AJ, and I don't want her to know the real AJ as well. And she might not even want to know the real AJ. And as a result of that, we have a relationship that can never grow and become close. Now, the only way a relationship can become close is that both of us don't compromise, but we still love each other. In other words, we don't get angry because the other person doesn't compromise, but they should not need to compromise on their desires and passions. Now, there are some desires and passions which are unloving. So, for example, if I'm in a relationship with Mary and I have a desire to be in a relationship with th three other women, right, now, that's obviously unloving to Mary and those other three women, is it not? Because of that, that is now an unloving desire, and I'm not suggesting you follow your unloving desires, but I am suggesting that you need to not compromise and tell your partner them. That's confronting, isn't it, as an idea? Like that your partner would know everything that's going on inside of you about your life and your internal dialogue. And it's a pretty confronting idea. But you'll be surprised at the results if you practice it. Um, particularly if both parties practice it. You'll get very, very close in terms of close, knowing each other close, than you've ever been before. Now that doesn't mean you'll still stay together. It just means that you're now truthful and honest and close about your, with your relationship in that you both know each other far better. So this whole idea of love being a compromise needs to be given up, I feel. There's even this idea, you, you see it a lot in negotiation. You, you, the whole term negotiation. Negotiation. I'm terrible again with this. Is this the e -A -T -I -O -N? Negotiation. Negotiation is all about compromise. compromise. Yeah, yeah. And I put to you that people who love do not need to negotiate. And the reason that you think about it. If two nations loved each other and there was a disagreement on the border of the two nations, then negotiating is not going to solve the problem. What's going to solve the problem is more love with each other. And one in love is willing to give up their right of something. So therefore, there's no need to negotiate. Somebody comes along and says to me, I want your house. Okay, no worries, you must need it more than I do. So you can have it and let's go somewhere else. and create. We can create anywhere. It's only lack, the lack of, the feeling of lack that would create this feeling of resistance and defense and then attack and then wanting to have a, have a war about it. Right? The whole process of war is all about when negotiation fails, if you think about it. It's not about when love fails. Oh, sorry, it's not about being loving to themselves or to others, but love has failed. But it's not about when... Um, what I meant by that is that it's not about this 
issue of well, sorry I'm just getting a heap of projection all of a sudden from spirits eh? I'm just wondering what's happening there I'm just trying to yeah this happened last Sunday uh, two Sundays ago remember when I was talking about the subject of um, the uh, religious and the, the Bible and the different, the different problems with the contra contradictions about love in the Bible and when I started talking about that there was just this heavy spirit energy just and I just get lots and lots of projections from spirits in that place and just then it was the same thing just feeling feeling that heavy projection and I'm just wondering what's going on for as a group when I start talking about world problems and issues what, what happens for yourself as a group of people like do you, do you know what happens for you like because for some reason, all of a sudden, then spirits just, just heavily overcloak the group in that place. Whenever I talk about religion or politics in a, in a world view, um, there is a big fear in the audience for some reason that allows this attraction. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, I start getting hammered and then I lose my place. Um, well, my microphone, you've got microphone is coming. From my point of view, I've got no control over any of those things, so I'm a, yep. little, yeah, a little bit fearful and distant from it. So every time I mention something that's good to do with something to do with the world, you sort of feel like, how can I change that? I can't, so what's the point of even talking about that? Yeah, do a lot of you feel that way? Like, yeah. Feel powerless? Because it's powerless stuff that a lot of the spirits hook into. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, you... Just if we have a mic up the back there. Where's the other mic? Yeah. Hey, I, I get a bit scared because we're involved with you and you're saying these things and these people are capable of like, the most horrible things you can imagine. Ah, yeah, so sort of by association, yeah, yeah. you getting embroiled in, my, uh, um, the in, thing, in the tax upon myself. The thing is I, I believe in all this stuff myself and it scares me of being kind of have a camera pointed at me or something, then the politics be like, oh, we just kill this guy or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Crucify him or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Chris. <laughs> I've done that already, yeah. Um, yeah, like I understand. In, in other words, a fear of the association, a fear that because I'm getting attacked, then anybody who comes along to see me will might start getting attacked type of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I just get confused when I don't really understand what you're saying. Yeah. And, um, and that's probably my issue with not being clear enough. But, uh, like, you were present, were you, two weeks ago with the discussion um, about... I was, out, I was outside at the time. Right. Cool, there's a reverb on my voice. Yeah. Yeah, I was outside at the time. But yeah. I heard about it. Right. Because there, there was a lot of that going on two weeks ago as well. Um, so, so do, do a lot of you feel like just by coming along to a session you're automatically associated with me and then there's a fear about me being attacked or is it just a, if, that you'll get attacked if I'm attacked? How many of you feel that? No? A few of you, not that many? Yeah, okay. I'm just trying to work through what it is going on emotionally. Um, see, thanks. For myself, when you start to talk about the world situation, watching it on the news at the moment, it's like it, it, you can feel that it's, <laughs> it's like if, if you had a holographic map of the world, it's like it's going off everywhere. Yep. And I think what you've been saying for a long time, now when I'm listening to the news, affects me emotionally, whereas once upon a time I could look at the news and you be quiet. You could distance yourself yeah, from I was it distanced, all. it was in another <laughs> country or somewhere. Now we know a whole lot of divine love people around the world that I yep. care about as well. So I have a particular interest in what's going on here and there more than I might have before. Yep. But the, if, if I felt a shift before, it's when you start talking about borders, it's like what's going on at the moment in, with Palestine and Israel and all the things that are just poised. And I think maybe our soul knowing is that everything's just poised to explode as well. 
Yeah. And I feel that comes to the surface when you start to discuss yeah. those things. Because it's just a, the whole audience gets overcloaked in fear and the and then the spirits just come and really heavy. Like two weeks ago, half half of the audience felt like they went to sleep. Um, just all of a sudden, you know, because of a discussion about the Bible. I, I went heavily asleep during that talk. Yeah. And and actually I, I don't get that at all because I I don't understand that and I still don't. Well, the, but but the this, this I really understand. Well, we had about nearly 50 million sp uh, spirits come and visit us last uh, two weeks ago while I was giving that talk who were in, enraged with me about talking about the Bible not being God's word. And, and they were just enraged with that concept. And I just feel that when the, the spirits project so much rage, there is a lot of openness in the audience to withdrawing and going into fear because of rage. And then, you know, that causes sort of the spirit influence to become even greater. Yeah. Um, and that, that's what I feel happens when I start talking about the world's view of anything. Obviously, I'm starting to confront the commonly acceptable viewpoints of love and truth. And whenever I start to confront those particular things, it feels like there's a deep fear in many people that when I start confronting those particular things, they just want to withdraw from, from the discussion. They don't want the confrontation to occur. The way I see it is that confrontation has to occur in the sense that truth has to confront error. Now, I don't mean that there has to be a fight about it. What I mean is that the truth has to be stated and held onto as truth rather than it just go silent and everyone try to run away from the truth. What often I find happening is that people sort of withdraw from stating the truth when error is present. And, and in that regard, it then feels like, to me, like error is bigger than truth is. Yeah. Mm. If we just have a mic up straight up. Uh, keep your hand up. up there. So does that make sense to you? Say, like, yeah, I just feel that that's often the case as well. Fire away. Uh, I just had this feeling, I really felt it pass through me. Oh, it's just not possible. And I just can't believe that, yeah. Yeah, that, no, that's and, a good point. And when you said about, oh, if somebody came into your home and wanted to take your home, I was thinking, is that not loving? Is that not being loving to yourself to actually say... Well, I'd ask them first if they're being loving to me. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. I wouldn't uh, just say, oh, here's my home, um, that's the end of it. But, but I would have certainly ask them whether they've considered love. But if they're going to, if they if they prefer to use force to take it from me, then why would they need force? I'm perfectly happy to give it to them, um, if if that's what they're going to do. But and and it's interesting when I say that I can feel the fear of many of you just go what, like just yeah. And just me saying it means sooner or later it's probably going to happen, right? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, yeah, it's on tape now, you know. The world will, the world will see it. And so then I'll have 500,000 people knocking at my door saying, we want your house, you know. <laughs> and and the, the reality is that I feel that love wouldn't compromise in the sense that it won't compromise love of myself. But, but, it, but it's not at the, like, I'm willing to just stand there and get shot about the issue, is what I'm saying. Do you, do you understand? Like I'm willing to stand at my house and say, no, I don't feel you're being loving, so I'm not going to give you my house. Right? And then somebody to shoot me as a result. Like I'm okay with that. Right? I'm not okay with pulling out a gun of my own and preventing them from taking such actions. I'm not okay with that. Um, that would feel really bad to me. So that's where I'm talking about love not compromising. So when I say negotiation, what I mean by negotiation specifically is where I give up this and you give up that and I give up this and you give up that and I give up this and you give up that and then we get to an agreement. Right? My question is, why don't we have an agreement already? There's already something out of harmony with love before we began for us to not agree. So let's talk about it, but not talk about giving up each one's position first. Let's look at what's harmonious with love. Now, if you look at what's happening in a worldview, 
You know, like in the Palestinian thing, for example. Recently, I think the US said that they're going to block the creation of a Palestinian state. Right? And so that means there's millions of people who don't have a country, um, who w want to get a country, and I'm going, why do we need a country? Why do you need Australia? Why do we, like, we don't need a country. We're world citizens. I should be able to go anywhere in the world. I should be able to set up home anywhere in the world that I want to set up home. I shouldn't have to... There shouldn't be borders. There shouldn't be, like, visas and, and you know, I'm, I have to fill out a three-month visa to enter, enter a country. I shouldn't have my fingerprints taken just to enter a country or exit a country or a photograph taken or any of those kind of things. Aside from perhaps a safety issue, maybe. When I say safety, I mean so that my mum and dad and brother and sister and friends and everyone can keep track of where I am. And then I'm starting to go, well, why'd they want to do that anyway? Like, I'm a free citizen. Like, and, and I'm feeling like, I feel like when I see all of those things, that all we're doing a lot of the times is we're protecting our little patch. That's what we're doing. And then we create a government that protects our patch for us. That's what we're doing. And I've often said to Mary, you know, the fastest way to fix some problems on the earth would to have a, be, have, have a mass exodus of all the people who are being oppressed from that particular location. So, for example, in uh, the Sudan, there's lots and lots of millions of people being oppressed there. They've created camps, uh, you know, refugee camps, millions of people big. Um, who, of people who are oppressed. Now, in Australia, we've got huge amounts of space, huge amounts of potential resources. We could easily offer help by actually helping all of the people who are being oppressed, who are being shot or raped or other things happening to them, just help them all by having shiploads or, or plane loads of them come over until the camp is empty. Now, once the camp's empty, there's nobody to rape. There's nobody to shoot. What are the people with the guns going to do? I don't know. They're certainly not going to be able to shoot or rape those particular people anymore, are they? And we could create an environment here where, the, where their life could be supported quite easily. And I feel... So I feel a lot of times what we're trying to do is negotiate because we want to hold on to a position of lack. Do, do you get that? We're trying to hold on to a position of lack, and so what we do, we, we negotiate with that position. We, we, we'll give up something, in other words, create a bit more lack for me, as long as a bit more lack gets created for you at the same time, and we negotiate another position. I feel that love doesn't do that. Love is loving, and so therefore automatically sees the need of another person and, by the way, can automatically see the greed of another person. Do you, do you see the difference? Like, we can, love sees the need and love also sees the greed. And love doesn't compromise with greedy people. Love, uh, love doesn't compromise with needy people either, by the way. Love doesn't compromise at all. But with greedy people, it certainly doesn't accede to a greedy person and give them more. Love would never do that. Love doesn't compromise those kind of principles. Love would see a need and desire, want to, fix it automatically. That's what love does. Love wants to repair problems that are, that are unloving. So love would always respond to needs and love would never respond to greed. And love would not compromise on those particular issues. Love would not negotiate with a greedy person in order to help a needy person. And if you think about a lot of politics in the world, world international politics, that's exactly what they're doing. They're negotiating with greedy people, the people who use most of the resources on the planet, are, are being asked to negotiate their position. Why do they have to be asked to be negotiated? They, be, they shouldn't be holding all of these resources of the planet. They should be automatically wanting to give it. 
when other people have less. So it's a bit like here, here in Australia. Often we have very big bumper crops at some times with regard to wheat, for example. Sometimes those crops are so large that the world market depresses so greatly that our Australian farmers can't even sell their wheat or sell it, have to sell it at hugely reduced prices. Now, the question I would ask myself firstly is, all right, let's look at the issues of where we're compromising. Now, what we're doing firstly is we're asking farmers to pay for food production by paying for the goods they receive in order to produce food. Now, why are we doing that? That doesn't make any sense to me. Food production and anybody who wants to be involved in it should be given the resources to do it for free, shouldn't they? Because we want food, don't we? Why would we have some kind of economic bargain in the place about food? So, so instead, we give the farmer all of the things he needs to do his passion, which is produce food. We give him everything he needs and help him out. And then he produces all this food and then what we do with the food, because we're not worried about any more about the farmer and whether he's got enough for himself because he's got plenty because we're giving him that. What we do now is we give away his crop. Does that not sound all right to you? Like, sounds all right? We give away his crop, and who would we give it to? Well, anybody who needs it. So anybody who needs wheat, we give them wheat. So instead of burning our wheat, as we do some years, here in Australia and overseas, that does happen, by the way, or it gets dumped into the sea, instead of doing that, we give it to a country who needs it. Why wouldn't we? Surely love would do that. But love wouldn't then, see, we wouldn't negotiate with greed. The greed is, I want the money for this, and instead of, and, and me having a tantrum because I'm not getting the money, I'm going to dump everything in the sea as a result. All of that effort and all that work and all of that produce gets dumped into the sea rather than saying no to greed and saying, no, what we're going to do is put this for free on the market and give it to the people who need it, but only to the people who need it, not the people who are greedy about it. That's what love would do. So love doesn't compromise on issues of truth or love. It doesn't allow things to get out of hand like that. Does that make sense to everyone? Have you given that much consideration in the world, like in how the world works? It's a, bit, it's a bit like, why do we have guns? Well, the reality is bullets kill people, yes, when they're shot out of a gun. Don't, do they not? So why don't we just stop producing all bullets? Why don't we do that? Surely love would do that, wouldn't it? Why don't we do that? Because of the greed of Western nations. That's why we don't do that. The greed of Western nations. Almost all the five biggest gun runners in the world are on the Security Council of the United Nations. Did you know that? The five biggest gun runners in the world are on the Security Council. That this is why we have like the US selling arms to places like Afghanistan and then 10 years, 15 years later, they're getting shot by their own arms. Right? And why is all that happening? Because of the greed of an economy that needs armaments to support its economy. One third of the US economy is based on armaments. Right? Now, is that love? It's not love. So a person who is love wouldn't compromise on those issues. They wouldn't. Just because they have the technology, they can sell it, doesn't mean they would. They wouldn't compromise on those kind of things. And why would you even produce it anyway? All we need to do to solve a problem like in Sudan is take away all the people who are being oppressed and no longer supply bullets to the people who are the oppressors. No longer supply any weapon at all, in fact. 
No machetes, no knives, no bullets. And if the whole world did that, like, there wouldn't be a need for a peace force in a certain country, would there? If you think about it, they wouldn't even have the means to fight it. But this is the problem we face, is that we are so embroiled in greed and the countries who are supplying these arms are so embroiled in greed. They want to maintain or improve their lifestyle. Even in Australia we do this. Right? How often do you find in Australia we talk about the, the desire for us to have some kind of growth economically? Now, if you think about it, growth economically means that each year we're going to be in a better place than we were last year economically. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel in comparison to the most of Africa, we're in a pretty good place economically. Most of us eat every day. In fact, I've not seen any of you not eat today. There's, there's food out there that we're giving away today because we brought enough more than what all of the 120 or 130 of us here need. Right? So, so we, we're able to give it away if we wanted to. It's just that we don't. So why don't we? Because we're worried about lack. It's all about greed. Now, love doesn't compromise on those issues either. Love doesn't say, oh, yeah, but I can't give it away or I can't do this or I can't do that with it. Like Love automatically sees the need and then doesn't compromise in what it does. And that's why myself and Mary do all of these things as a gift. And we've got a little contribution up the box there if you want to give us a gift in return, but it's not a requirement of you. And it's the same with regard to these countries. Why, why, why would we not give a country the resources that we have without requiring that it pay for it? Why would we not do that? Like, that to me doesn't make any sense. We, why can't we just give it away? There's obviously something wrong with the economy and the way the economies are structured for not being able to do this. There's something unloving in the way everything's constructed. So this is very important, I feel. We need to start looking at this emotion of comparing the emotion of having to to that emotion of wanting to. That's what we really, really need to do. What do we want to do? Elaine, just step the back there. In regards to the sedan, to me, the loving thing would also be when the danger's removed, to allow those people and support them to go home, provide them a way home, well, without well, an expectation that they just do stop something for, a, for us. Just stop for a moment though, Elaine. What's this whole concept of home? Yeah, or go, yeah, sorry, home. Go back if they wanted to, I mean. I feel anybody who wants to go anywhere in the world should be able to go anywhere in the world. Yeah. But stop calling it home. Yeah. I just said to someone earlier, wherever a roof is, that's when I'm home. But yeah, so then I... Well, I say that home is the earth that we're yeah. living on, wherever that be. And the, the feeling I have is that if we start calling a single location on this planet home, we are already now creating a border. We're creating yeah. a line which we don't want others to cross over. And that automatically creates borders, which automatically creates friction, which automatically creates the need for negotiation, which automatically creates compromise. And, and by now, we're a long way away from love. So like, what you're saying is while they were somewhere else, gives them the opportunity to understand that, to remove that attachment from so-called home as well. All of us on this planet yeah. need to remove the attachment to a location. We need to... We need to start asking ourselves, just are we happy and are the people we with the people we want to be with? That's all we need to really ask ourselves. And it doesn't matter where that is, it will be called home. Yeah. We need to give up this idea that, of a whole nation being in a certain location and that is their home. I don't, I don't agree yeah. with that at all. And the reality too is unfortunately because we now have this homeland idea we now create security for our homeland. And 
we do this here in Australia in our own backyards because many of us have bought a security system to protect our own home. Right? So what we've done is we've created a, a line on the ground, we've put fences around. Interesting, isn't it, this fence idea? How much wasted material is in fences? Huge amounts of wasted material. Huge iron ore deposits completely depleted because of a fence. Forests cut down to create fences. Right? What does a fence do? Creates a border. What does a border do? It creates mine, yours, mine, yours, mine, and so forth. It creates delineation between who the owners are. And why do I have a concept of ownership? Because I have a concept of lack. That's the only reason why I have a concept of ownership. The way? Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. Um, and the, the most numerous arguments in courts to do with property is about fences. Exactly, exactly. And what, why is there such things? Because we're all wanting to protect our little slice because we've all worked with the sweat of our brow to create that little slice because it has never been given to us in the first place. It was, it, we had to, like a lot of our life was involved in, like God gave us the earth and you know what we then did? We cut it up into slices and sold it off rather than recognising that actually the original giver wanted us to give it to other people if we could. And we can. That's the reality too. So the, the problem is that every time I talk about some of these things, everyone goes, yeah, now you're just talking about utopia. You know? It's like, it's not going to exist. And what I'm suggesting to you is that it will exist, but when our heart understands love, rather than accepting the world's definition of it, that's when it will exist. And, and that has to start with somebody, with some group of people who want to love, showing the world how to love. So, so out at home, we're in the process of pulling out our fences. Now, some neighbours don't want us to do that because they've got sheep or cattle or whatever and so we leave those fences intact. Other neighbours, they're perfectly happy with us doing that and so we've pulled out the fence along the front of our house and the fence down one side of our house adjoining another neighbour who wants to do the same thing. Does that make sense? On the land that we were wanting to become a learning centre for God's way of love, we want to pull down all the fences. Get rid of all the fences. Because we see fences as just a way of dividing up land, creating barrier, creating division, and eventually creating disharmony as a result of all those creations. Yep. And so this is all where it's hard nowadays to live a life that doesn't compromise love, you see, because every time you try to live a life that doesn't compromise love, there are people around you who feel like, what, what, what's going on? What's going on? What, why are you wanting to do that? And they start questioning what's actually happening. My feelings are that eventually everyone will question the unloving thing. <laughs> eventually. At the moment, people are questioning, is that love? I don't think that's love when it is, eventually we want to get to the stage where everyone's going, that's definitely not loving and we need to try and do something about that. That's where we need to get as a society. Okay, now there are the main things I wanted to talk about today. Um, oh, there might be one more actually. Oh yeah, there's a, one more that's a really good one. Uh, this is a love thing. Uh, I might just go for a different colour. Love allows white lies. Shall we define a white lie? It's the kind of lie that makes another person feel good or the kind of lie doesn't make them feel bad. Uh, and the truth is, love never lies. Not even little white ones. 
Uh, yeah. I find the whole concept of white lies very interesting. Because really a white lie is told in order to help yourself or another person avoid an emotion they do not want to feel or you think they don't want to feel. So the wife comes up and I've used this example. Do I look fat in this? <laughs> and the white lie is, no darling, beautiful, you're looking great. Right? <laughs> Even though she's put on 25 kilograms over the last six months, right? she's still looking great. And uh, instead of saying the truth, no, I think you're overweight now. And it's not good for you to be overweight. And I'm a bit worried for you. Like, what's going on for you emotionally that caused you to be so overweight? Now, why doesn't that happen? Because the guy is scared... Yeah, see, many of you were going to swear there, weren't you? <laughs> Purposefully done. The guy, the guy is very scared about telling the truth, isn't he? He's afraid of what's going to happen. And I put to you that even the creation of so-called white lies is all about the level of fear we have about telling the truth and actually living the truth. Yeah. And if we have fear, remember, fear is not love. So when we have fear, so fear allows white lies. Fear is the creator of white lies, actually. Fear is what allows it. When we fear, we're never going to get a good ex result, ever. There's always going to be a negative result, collectively and individually, from the expression of fear. And at some point, humanity needs to come to accept that as a basic truth. Now, this position of love never lying basically relates to that previous thing I was talking about, compromise. In that whenever we falsify ourselves to another person, we're actually lying to the other person. And love doesn't do that. Love presents yourself as you truly are. Even to yourself, but all but also to others. That's what love would do. And so we would never lie and we would never believe that there is such a thing as a white one, a white lie, a lie that's done for a good purpose. You see, every time I do something to help you avoid an emotion, I am not helping you. I am hindering your growth towards God. I am hindering your growth towards love. Even if you don't believe in God, I'm hindering your growth towards love. If I lie to you about something, that's what I'm doing. And even telling a little white one. So you say, you know, these little white ones often are about personal appearances, aren't they? Have you noticed that? Like how much weight do I have? Do I look good in this? All of those kind of things. So your wife's just bought a $250 dress and it's in, it's in brown and every time she wears brown she looks terrible. But she's just bought it. What do you say? You look terrible in brown. If that's what you feel, you say it. You look terrible in brown. Why don't you buy red? You look hot in red. Right? Or something like that. So we would not lie for the purpose of cheering the other person up. You see this happening so much, you know, in the movies, eh? I suppose the movies are just a reflection of our of our day-to-day -day life. But you often see it with parents and children under stress, where the parent puts the arms around the children or gives the child a hug. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to let that happen. Now, to be frank with you, how can you even present, prevent something from happening in your own life, let alone the life of your child? Like, it's pretty hard, you know, to present, prevent an accident occurring in your own life, let alone the life of your child. So how can you give them this reassurance? Isn't it a fear-based white lie that you're just telling them in order to make yourself or them feel good? 
We need to stop all of that. If our child says, I'm scared here, we look at the situation, we go, yeah, I can understand why you're scared there. I would be too. If the situation that they're presenting is based around some fearful events. A young child today came up to me and said in her, in her um, school, there was blood still on the ground from a, f- a five or six-year-old m- son being murdered by his own father at the school grounds. Now that's pretty frightening, isn't it? If the child feels frightened about that, surely you wouldn't go, oh, it's not, you know, it's going to be, everything's going to be all right, don't worry about it. You wouldn't be doing that. You say, you're allowed to be frightened about that. That's a pretty scary event. And then they'd work through their fear and their fear would leave them and eventually they wouldn't have that fear anymore if you allowed them to release it. Yeah? These are kind of events that um, can feel frightening, so we need to allow people to feel what they feel. White lies are an effort to make a person feel something different. to what they actually feel. And I put to you that when you love a person, you don't do that to them. You don't try to make them feel something different to what they actually feel. You encourage them to feel what they actually feel instead. Yeah. So if you look at all of the different types of and we could keep on going on for weeks and weeks and weeks couldn't we really about the world's different edition, definition of love there are literally like hundreds and hundreds of different things that we've myself and mary through discussion have come up with that that we see the world has a definition that that's loving the reality is that it's not the key in your own life is to become more sensitive to what you're being told by the world as to what love is does that make sense to everyone? To, to be more sensitive about it. Mary, you want to say something? Um, if we could just have the mic there. Thanks. Yep. I should, I... <laughs> ah, so it's not a question. It started out as a question. <laughs> yep. but I, I, It's something that I want to uh, maybe ask you to talk about, but it's something that I feel passionate about, and that is about... We've done this very intellectual exercise today, uh, which has been very logical. Like lots of people have responded to the to what we've been saying. I can feel that. Yeah. We've talked about the world's definition of love, and I think that's pretty heavily in a lot of us in a lot of different ways. And we've talked about God's definition of love, and how that challenges those false beliefs in us. But I want to talk about, or ask you to talk about, God, <laughs> because. Um, I feel like in my life now I've been so attuned to the world's definition of love because I had parents who taught me the world's definition of love or I grew up in an environment who taught me the world's definition of love. But what I'm experiencing now is that, um, yes, I need to be humble to releasing the errors and recognising these things as erroneous, but there is a process of opening my heart to God which teaches me also and I think that's why you and I, um, we can talk for hours about this because this God's definition of love is so dear to us. And it, yeah, uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, good. <laughs> can you say it better? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Let's have a go. Um, what Mary's talking about is that the more things we list about the world's definition of love being incorrect. It feels like we're gathering a list of all the things we need to learn to do and all the things we need to learn to drop. Do you, do you see that? Like we're sort of like, all right, so now we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and we keep on going. All of these things are all the loving things to do. And on the opposite side, we've got one, two, all the unloving things to do, right? Now, the danger for us is that we attempt to try to do the loving thing 
and try to not do the unloving thing without engaging the more simple process. And the more simple process is this. Here's my soul. Here's God. God has inbuilt in her systems all of the loving things. And God's love has inbuilt in it all the loving things. And God loves us in all of these ways that you've been discussing today. In all of the loving ways. God already loves us that way. Now, if I can somehow have God's love enter me, enter my soul, now instead of trying to do all of the loving things, it will actually be automatic that I do all of the loving things without trying. And instead of trying to not do all of the unloving things, it will be automatic for me to not do anything unloving because I am now in harmony with God's soul. Now, this is the difference between natural love, all the natural love paths that are on the planet, and the divine love path. The difference between those two paths is very simple in that both paths become loving. You can be an atheist and follow the natural love path and you will become more loving. You don't even have to believe in God. You don't have to have any spiritual beliefs aside from a belief in love in order to become more loving. That's the reality. However, the simpler thing to do is to experiment with this relationship. And that's what Mary is getting at, really. Yeah, rather than engaging this process that we've talked about with your intellect, if you can engage it with God... And I know a lot of times we're blocked to God because of our errors in love. But, I, yeah, I just feel so passionately that th this is the rapid way to do it. Mm. Um, we need to confront the error, and that's going to be emotional if we do it from a heart space. But if we engage God in that, then it, yeah. Mm. That was about what you were saying? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, babe. <laughs> just trying to get it out. <laughs> <laughs> and... My feeling is very similar to Mary's in that it is much simpler working through this relationship because what happens is as God's love enters your soul, you automatically feel drawn to the more loving action and you automatically feel drawn to no longer engage in the less loving action. And you don't need anybody else to tell you what's loving and what's unloving. It's just an automatic process within yourself because you're now joined with the, lo the loving God that created the universe, you now have the ability to determine what's loving or not inside of yourself without needing to ask anybody else what's loving or what's unloving. And the beauty of doing that is that it is actually a simpler process because God's love is transforming your soul. And it's like, if we go back to our original diagram, remember I drew the soul and I said that the soul had openings due to fear that allowed fear-based beliefs, remember I said that, to enter it. That makes sense, right? Well, conversely, it would also make sense then, if that's the case, that if we open our soul, so here's our soul, which is now getting bigger because it's now more loving, is open to love-based beliefs, then those love-based beliefs would automatically enter it without any resistance. Wouldn't that also make sense? If, if this is the way that we accept fear-based beliefs, this must be the way we have to accept love-based beliefs. And we're not going to be able to be in fear and attempt to accept a love-based belief. Because the soul in fear has a blockage to the love-based belief. And so it's not easily going to enter. And so what we'll end up having to true, do if we don't change the love in our soul, we're going to have to change our actions or our words or our thoughts. And it's going to mean trying and a lot of effort. 
if we do this. And this is why many of you feel like it's a real struggle, right? Because, because you're still you, you're noticing, yes, I need to do that. That's not loving. This is loving. What's loving? Oh, yes, that's loving. We, we even have to ask ourselves what's loving, right? Oh, that's loving. That's right. That's right. I remember that that was loving. And that wasn't very unloving. But what about this situation? This is, seems to be a different situation. What do I do there? And the reason why we're asking all these questions is because the love hasn't opened our soul yet so that we know automatically what's loving and what isn't loving and automatically do that, whatever that is. Now, if we receive love from God, this has the effect of opening our soul to love-based belief systems. So now love beliefs have the ability to enter our soul. Now, once a love belief enters our soul as an emotion, you will not be able to do anything else other than the love dictates. It's quite that simple. The love will dictate an action that, that you just would not even want to try to avoid. In fact, it will be a desire, a passionate desire to follow it. And that really is the contrast between the world's, false, the world's definition of love and our definition of love. In God's definition of love, which we've, ex we've learnt ourselves and, and begun to start to accept. The world's definition of love is fear-based. It opens us to fear-based belief systems and keeps us in a state of fear with our actions. God's system opens ourselves up to love-based beliefs that enter our soul. Just as it's automatic to be afraid here, it's now automatic to love here. In exactly the same manner. And this state, once it's automatic to love, fear won't even be a consideration in your life again. Now once we become at one with God, all fear ceases. Now it's interesting that even stuff like the Bible says that. In the Bible it says this. I'll read you this one. There is, this is 1 John 4.18, for those of you who would like to write it down. There is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear, because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Now that is a basic truth, in my opinion. The basic truth that once we're perfected in love... Fear will no longer be in our soul, like that. So now what happens is we haven't got an opening to any fear beliefs. Does everyone see that? We no longer have an opening to fear-based beliefs because the fear that was in our soul is now being removed. And now that prevents us from even having an acknowledgement of any fear-based beliefs. We see them externally but they do not enter us inside of us. They don't dictate to us our life ever again. Now in that place, any new fear belief that's presented to me cannot be accepted because my soul is now resonating with love and so therefore only love-based beliefs can enter it. They're the only type of beliefs that can enter it now. Now, once we get to that state where love is the only thing that dictates our belief systems, now we have learnt what true spirituality is. You see, in the world today, I feel there's a lot of presentation of all forms of spirituality, but what I notice consistently is there is not much emphasis on love. You know, there's doctrine with most faiths. There's doctrine, is there not? With most uh, presentations, there's the physical, the metaphysical, but how much of it is actually based around love, the emotion of love? And yet I put to you that love is the greatest thing that can enter our soul because once love enters our soul, no fear can ever reside in it again. And once we get into that state, 
we now no longer have this definition of love, the world's definition of love. We now have our Creator's definition of love inside of us, dictating to us every single action. Not because it's a dictator, but because love itself has the ability to guide every single thought, word and action that we have. Yeah. And now the love is in our soul, we are completely protected from any unloving belief. You see, most on the planet, we have so much fear of different belief systems. We don't need to fear different belief systems at all. Because it's only the loving ones that will enter us. Can you see? Why would we ever need to fear again? Only the loving belief systems will ever enter us. So we don't need to be afraid of what belief systems there are and whether we should follow them or not because love would dictate everything including the acceptance of new truth so what I'd like you to do what I'd like to encourage you to do in your own life is to allow this process of fear to come out of you which is actually an emotional experience it's not something you're going to go I no longer fear and you intellectually work that out not like that you're going to have to work your way through your fears in a real sense and feel them emotionally. But as these fears exit, so as the fear gets thrown out of your soul, if you like, you will end up that love is the only thing that dictates your soul's actions. It's the only thing that dictates your soul's beliefs. It's the only thing that dictates whatever happens in your life. As a result of that, once one person enters that state, two people, three people, five people, ten people, you can see that everyone around them is going to be affected by that state, are they not? So eventually there'll be a hundred people, and eventually there'll be a thousand people, and eventually there'll be ten thousand people, because love is very attractive. Love is the most attractive force in the universe, actually. And once we understand that, that fear is actually just the creation of man and is the least attractive thing. And love, the creation of God, is the most attractive emotion you could ever have. And you think about it in your own life. Isn't that the case? When you're actually in love, almost the rest of your life stops, doesn't it? Pretty much everything revolves around the love you feel. That's how powerful love is. Fear is not very powerful at all. It will only motivate a person if they are afraid. That's the only motivator. If they're no longer afraid, fear can't even motivate them anymore. So in this place, desire, passion, love is what will motivate our lives. And instead of fear, the world's definition of love is basically fear. Right? Instead of that motivating our life, instead of fear motivating it, love motivates us and when we get into that state collectively there is a huge power that that state has of infecting with love every single person around us and every single process around us it's such a beautiful condition that nothing can withstand in its way because love is the most powerful force in the universe that we can experience so hopefully uh, that's given you a bit more of a background about the world's definition of love. The next talk we have about the world's definition of love, which will be the last talk about the subject, we'll talk about more about the feelings of love and what the feelings of love are. Rather than just what love does, we're going to talk about what love feels like. That makes sense? So that'll be our discussion next. Um, Hopefully you've enjoyed that today. We've enjoyed meeting those of you who are new um, here today. And we hope to see you again at some time, perhaps. Thank you for your time today. We know your time is precious. And we'd also like to thank you for your donations today, for those of you who have donated. Uh, we do really appreciate the donations that you give us because it helps myself and Mary live, but also to get a lot of things done for free for other people. Thank you for your time, guys, and we look forward to seeing you again at some point. <laughs>